Aloha. Good evening from Hawaii. Good afternoon or good almost good night, depending on uh, where you are now. And my name is Hui, and um, I'm one of the members of the Montiel Lalo team. And I, uh, on behalf of our team, I really want to welcome you to our fourth uh, webinar on the series of communicating, communicating language research. Uh, Montiel Lalo, or MO for short, it is a um, student-led initiative aiming to make language research findings more accessible and engaging in multiple languages through various ways of communication, infographic, uh, written communication, and video. And before we begin, um, the Mantiolelo team would like to thank the Department of Second Language Studies here at UH Manoa uh, for their continuous support uh, for the Mantiolelo initiative uh, since it was established in uh, 2018. And we also would like to express our thanks to the Student Equity Excellence Diversity Program here at the University of Hawaii for funding this event. And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Um, I think many of you know him very well already, Dr. Willie Vinandia. Dr. Willie Vinandia is a language teacher educator with extensive teaching experience in Asia. And he currently teaches applied linguistics courses at the National Institute of Institution, Nanjiang um, Technological University in Singapore. And he is also a frequent um, plenary speaker at international English language teaching conferences and has published extensively in the area of second language uh, education. So his publications include um, Language Teaching uh, Methodology, an Anthology of Current Practice in 2002 by Cambridge University Press. And um, also he published um, Student Center Cooperative Learning in um, 2019 by Springer International. And his most recent publications include a book chapter, The Primacy of Extensive Reading and Listening, Putting Theory into Practice uh, in 2020, co-author with our legendary professor, Dr. Richard Day here at University of Hawaii, Panua. And he also maintains a large language professional development forum called Teacher Voices on Facebook. Now, one thing I want to add is, you know, uh, Dr. Willie Vinadia also received his MA degree from the Department of Second Language Study here around 25 years ago. Back then, it was mm. uh, the Department of ESL. Yes. Uh, okay, <laughs> without further ado, right. yes. let's welcome Dr. Vinadia for his talk on making research uh, meaningful and accessible to stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so excited. Aloha, everyone. My talk today is about this very, very important topic for all of us here in the audience, how we can make research meaningful and more importantly, also accessible to stakeholders because eventually we want our research to find its application, its way, you know, all the way to the end users. So today I'm going to share with you what I do know uh, based on my experience about how, you know, I you know, do my research and how I then communicate my research to a wider group of people, to my uh, stakeholders. But before that, let me share with you a little bit about my university, especially for those of you who are doing your master's degrees at the moment. If you are considering uh, doing your doctorate, come to my university. I work at the uh, School of Education within the university. It's called the National Institute of education. It's one of the best teacher education institutions in the world. One of the many. But in Singapore, it's number one. In Singapore, it's number one. Reason being, it's the only one in Singapore. So we don't have any competitors. That's the beauty of working in a small place like uh, Singapore. We've got a range of master's programs, MA, uh, in various areas of education. Master's of education, a PhD program, and also a doctor in education program. So please consider coming to Singapore. Hawaii is a good place too, but Singapore is not a bad place. Yeah, do consider coming to uh, Singapore for your graduate studies. Okay, now I let me begin with this uh, one single statement, which I would all of us like to remember as I go through my slides Hopefully at the end of the session, you'll remember this very important takeaway. Everyone, you and me in the audience has a role to play in advancing research and in making it relevant uh, for our stakeholders, yeah? 
And who are your stakeholders? Maybe different from mine, but my stakeholders include students, teachers, researchers, curriculum developers, and more importantly also, the uh, people working at the Ministry of Education. These are people who deal with policy decisions, who introduce new policies in schools and things like that. Let me begin then my presentation by sharing with you a very nice, a very simple framework for thinking about the uh, knowledge ecosystem from the initial stage of knowledge production, number one, to knowledge translation, to informing the public about the piece of knowledge that you have produced, and also eventually working with important people, working with stakeholders, working with policy decision makers, working with head of departments and things like that to, uh, to, to make it possible for your piece of research or insights that you gain from research to be actually uh, implemented in uh, the school context or in some other edu educational institution context. And throughout my session, I would like us to think about this. Where do you and I fit in in this, in this whole process? Yeah, let me say this again. Where do you and I fit in? in the uh, knowledge production and in the uh, knowledge dissemination uh, process. Let me begin with the first one. Uh, let me start by sharing with you uh, what my university is doing uh, in terms of creating, producing knowledge. Uh, in my university, like in many other research universities, has a very strong research center. And in Singapore, in my university, in my school of department uh, education, it's called the Office of Education uh, Research. What does it do? It does a lot of things, including the following. It's got its own group of research faculty, and they are known as research scientists. So we've got junior research scientists, we've got senior research scientists, and we've got also very, very senior uh, research scientists whose job mainly is to do research and nothing else. They do a little bit of teaching occasionally, but most of the time they, you know, their main job is to conduct, investigate, to uh, do research. The unit also manages a lot of research funds. We are looking at millions of dollars here. Uh, you, most of the money comes from the uh, Singapore government and from, also from other sources. The center also has a research integrity unit. It's becoming very important nowadays for universities to have a unit within the university that looks after uh, you know, issues related to research ethics, for example. I know that in my university, every graduate student who wants to do research will have to take online courses on uh, ethics approval and things like that. The, Center also has a research mobilization unit and, the, and the, uh, the main job of that unit is to make sure that the uh, research that has been done is synthesized, is communicated to uh, important uh, stakeholders. We also have other uh, admin support unit, you know, for the hiring of research assistants, research associates and other important people that support the work of uh, researchers. Okay. Uh, what do faculty members or researchers or professors do in my university? Depending on, how, on, depending on the, uh, on the uh, uh, position of the uh, professors, depending on what track they are in, whether they are on a research track or whether they are on a teaching track, uh, chances are if, if, if you are talking to people on the research track, they are more likely to be doing what has been called disciplinary type of research. Very uh, content specific, very academic specific uh, type of research and the purpose of which is to actually uh, expand the, the border or the frontier of, uh, of knowledge. On the other hand, there are also people like me who are doing a lot more of the applied type of research, pedagogical type of research and conceptual type of research. Yeah. What is important for us to remember is this, these knowledge producers are equally important in the uh, whole scheme of uh, knowledge uh, ecosystem. 
They play different roles, but they play equally important roles in knowledge production and also knowledge uh, dissemination. Let me just give you two examples of the kind of research that we do uh, in my university, in particular, uh, people in TESOL or second language education. Now, here is an example of, of, of what I would call disciplinary type of research. The title of the uh, uh, paper that was, that was published in, in a journal is called A Cognitive Perspective on Language Learners Listening Comprehension Problems. Uh, and that is the, the uh, author, uh, Professor Christian Goh. Uh, it was published in a very good journal, in a Q1 journal, uh, with very good impact factor as well. And if you look at the number of citations, this is fairly typical of a good piece of research paper that was published in a top tier research journal, about 1000 plus now, yeah. On the right hand side, you've got people like me who publish conceptual papers. And this particular one is interesting. It was published in a journal called English Language Teaching. It was a very short paper. It was a conceptual paper. And if you look at the title, you can tell immediately that this is the kind of paper that is uh, relevant, applicable for teachers, for people who want to investigate uh, the topic of extensive listening in English language teaching. Not bad. So far, it has generated about 300 plus citations. So, so that's good. Yeah. So briefly again, uh, step number one is for universities, for people uh, to be uh, knowledge producers. They can produce you know, uh, research type or disciplinary type of knowledge, or they can also produce a conceptual or pedagogical type of knowledge. That's point number one. Point number two is knowledge translator, an extremely, uh, or knowledge translation, an, an extremely important step in the whole knowledge uh, production and knowledge ecosystem. So the key question here is, how do we pass on knowledge to other people? Let me share with you two ways of doing this. The first one is probably known as knowledge telling or information uh, sharing. I'm using a model developed by Carl Bereiter many years ago when he talked about uh, different groups of students uh, when they write, uh, you know, written compositions. Some kids are not very good and they are mostly engaged in knowledge telling and some kids are very good in expressing their thoughts because they are very audience oriented and things like that. And these are known as uh, knowledge uh, transforming, uh, you know, way of writing. So in the same way, when we try to translate, when we try to communicate our research to the public, we can do it in two uh, different ways, but they're different. In a knowledge telling uh, situation, basically you are telling people as it is. And, and, and very often you use a lot of technical and research jargons like coefficient alpha, one tail test, hypothesis testing, and things like that. You also tend to use very complex and very often ambiguous language. Now, this is the kind of language that researchers or hardcore researchers usually use to uh, explain uh, their findings, for example, in, in something like this. You know, the results show that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the experiment uh, is significant, but it demonstrates a very complex interactions among different variables under investigation. Very complex, very ambiguous, yeah? On the other hand, if you are engaged in a, in, a, in, a, in a conversation with people on the ground, people, you know, teachers or policymakers and things like that, you may want to use a different ways of communicating uh, your research. Yeah. You may want to use, for example, very uh, easy uh, user-friendly language. For example, by saying that group A outperformed group B by 30%. I think that's the kind of language that is easier to understand for uh, people. Uh, out there in the classroom or in the school context. You may want to use very uh, easy to uh, understand language as well. The results are positive, statistically speaking, but it's just too small. It's not worth your time or effort or money to invest in. Yeah, so two different ways of doing this. Now, let me share with you my experience. My experience 
my years of experience uh, has has sort of you know made me realize that the process of knowledge telling to knowledge transforming actually takes a long time. It takes years and years. It involves three major uh, stages. I remember when I first graduated from the university, I would use a lot of difficult ideas, difficult concepts, different constructs. But along the way, I was able to deconstruct this information or this knowledge and later reconstruct it using language that is easy to uh, understand. Yeah, most of you who are doing uh, your graduate studies now, you are, I think, in the process of developing a domain specific knowledge. In other words, you are building knowledge of the field of your specialization. Once you have graduated, like uh, Anna Mendoza, for example, I think she will soon be engaged. Anna, you're still there? Uh, Anna yes, Mendoza, I, uh, yes. Yes, Hello. yes, yes. Can I show your face, please? Can you show your face, please? Yes, I think very soon you'll be engaged in this deconstruction process. Yeah. Five years down the road, 10 years down the road, you'll be trying to find applications of what you have learned at the University of Hawaii. And you will try to personalize things a little bit so that ideas that you learn from your professors become something that is more you rather than something that you have heard from other people. And along the way, you will find yourself specializing uh, in one or two areas of research. And finally, st step number three, step number three, you'll be doing a lot of reconstruction, knowledge sharing with people from a wider group of people, not just fellow graduate students or fresh graduates, but also a wider group of people, your students, your fellow faculty members, and maybe teachers uh, out there in Hong Kong and in some other places, yeah? So this process is extremely important but it takes time. For me, it has taken more than 10 years to be able to actually uh, develop a specific area of specialization and being able to communicate, to talk to people from different groups of you know, uh, layers in our society. Now, here are some examples of extremely good people who are able to communicate complex ideas using very, very uh, accessible uh, language. You've got the uh, legendary Professor Richard Day. Uh, his book, Extensive Reading the Second Language, for example, is written in a, in, a, in a style that is really, really easy to understand and to comprehend. And that book actually has generated, has rekindled a huge research interest in extensive reading all over the world. Yeah, another person I want to mention is Jack Richards. He is very extremely good at translating uh, ideas at synthesizing ideas uh, and then rewritten these ideas in books, in book chapters, in journal articles and things like that. For me, the past five years I've been doing this, I've been trying to translate ideas that I've learned from the uh, professional literature, from the academic literature into something that is more portable, something that is more accessible. And I've done this for the past few years. And what I, I'm doing now is I make these books or these ebooks accessible and also freely uh, available for people to view and also for people to download. Yeah, I'll show you the website later on so that you can visit and download some of the books there. I'm done with two. The first one is knowledge production. The second one is knowledge translation, two very important stages in the uh, knowledge ecosystem. The third one, Equally important is knowledge uh, spreading or you know, informing uh, your knowledge to a wider group of uh, people. This is where you need to reach out to the public, to reach out to the uh, communities out there. The purpose of this is for, for, for you to create awareness in, to the public that, hey, you've got something that is worth sharing, something that you want to share to uh, people out there uh, in the community. How do you do that? Let me share with you four ways of doing this. Number one is through publications. Number two is through conferencing. Number three, through media outreach. And finally, through direct contact with people that you know, your friends, your contact, your former you know, professors and things like that. Let me begin with the first one, journal. This is probably the most uh, obvious, you know, outlet 
uh, for you to communicate your ideas uh, to uh, people in the same area as you. But look, uh, different types of journals out there, yeah? You may be sending or you may be publishing your papers in research-oriented journals, high-impact research journal for greater citability because citation is important in, in your job, for example. And because of that, you may want to publish your work in a big journal like System, TESOL Quarterly, Language Learning, and other uh, similar journals. My advice to you, though, is for you to also consider publishing in the more practice-oriented journals. So journals like Modern English Teacher, it has a wide readership. English Language Teaching, the ELT journal published by Oxford University Press, for example, that one also has a wide readership, international uh, readership. In other words, uh, you may want to publish in both research and teaching journals, both for citability and also for visibility. Let me share with you uh, a small uh, paper that I've written, essentially giving people advice about how they can make their publications, their research more visible and more citable. And this ebook is free for you to download if you are still with me at, until I get to the end of my session today. Yeah. People be very careful. Yes, there are many different journals out there and many of them are known as predatory uh, journals. These are really, really bad journals. You know, never, never publish your papers in, uh, in these journals. Uh, if you work in some universities, research universities in, in, the, in, in, in the US or in Singapore, for example, you may run the risk of losing your job if you publish your papers in these bad journals. So remember the thing to check and think again and check again before you send your manuscript to uh, journals of your choice. I've had, you know, junior faculty members uh, who mistakenly publish his paper in a bad journal when he was doing his graduate studies in some place in the world. Yeah. But the important thing is he was aware of that sub subsequently, and now he becomes very careful before he sends his papers for publications in a journal. How do we know whether a journal is predatory, bad journal or not? Just use my three rules of thumb. Three. Number one, publish with mainstream publishers. I think you, if you've been around for some years, I think you know that these are some uh, of the mainstream publishers in our field. They are credible, they are reputable. Cambridge University Press, Routledge, for example, Wiley, uh, Multilingual Matters and things like that. These are reputable uh, publishers. So you'll be safe if you publish in these journals. Number two, publish in journals uh, managed by professional associations in our field. Remember the keyword is in our field. Well, in the case of uh, you know, ELT, TESOL, I think you are familiar with TESOL Association. And in Asia, one of the biggest professional association is Asia TEFL. So it's safe if you publish with those uh, journals. And number three, there are journals out there published by credible educational institutions. For example, the University of Hawaii. It has, it, 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 it manages a journal in the area of second language reading called Reading in a Foreign Language. The editor is Professor Richard Day. So you can be sure that this is the kind of journals that you want to send your manuscripts uh, to. Yeah, so three rules of thumb to remember. Another way of communicating your uh, research is through conferencing. Again, the same thing, there are pedagogical conferences and there are academic conferences. You need to go to both, occasionally to academic conferences but also to, you know, some other times to pedagogical conferences. For me, most of the time I would go to the uh, uh, so-called pedagogical uh, conferences because I work mostly with teachers and other teacher, language teacher educators. Yeah. So Asia TEFL conference, for example, JASET in Japan and some other uh, conferences organized by other professional associations in our field. More recently, I've been reaching out to 
a big place, China, where millions of teachers are out there waiting to, you know, to be entertained basically by people like you and me. So last year I did quite a bit of webinars for universities in China, and you'll be surprised at how many of the number of people who came to these conferences or to these webinars. We are talking not about 100 or 200 people attending. We are looking at 1,000, 2,000, or the last one that I did, 10,000 people actually attending. Uh, that to me is one of the best ways of reaching out, yeah, communicating your ideas, your research to the uh, stakeholders there. Yeah. Media outreach. This is another great way of communicating of informing the public about uh, your insights, your research ideas, your research findings. As for me, I've been using Facebook groups. I've also put my research papers and publications in online repositories like academia.edu, ResearchGate, and more recently in my own website. It's Willie's ELG Corner. Yeah, these are some examples of my uh, Facebook groups. It has a very, very wide reach with members uh, in the thousands and members coming from all over the world. So that is one way of reaching out to the public or communicating your ideas to the general public. Finally, direct communication. Now this is rather unorthodox way of communicating your wishes to other people but it's becoming uh, more popular these days. Direct communication basically is you tell people, you systematically and intentionally send your research, your papers to people that you know. Yeah, so you can uh, reach out to your circle of friends. You can offer free talks, free workshops, staff seminars. You can communicate to stakeholders deans and HODs, very important people because these are the kind of people who are likely to make use of the ideas that you send to them. Yeah, so send your papers to these people. Don't forget to send your papers to top scholars in the field because these are the kind of people uh, who are likely to be interested uh, in you know, more recent uh, research done by the more emerging or junior uh, researchers. I've done all these three. Now the question that we have or that people might have is this, is direct communication, reaching out to people, sending your papers uh, to people via emails, for example, is this okay or is this not okay? Anna, are you still there? Have you, have you done this before, Anna? Anna Mendoza. Anna, um, are you still there? Yes. 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 Have you done this before? Is it okay? Is it not okay? Are you, you know, do you have reservations about this? I think it has to do with um, your reasons for, like, I wouldn't just send one of my papers to a scholar and be like, hey, read this. <laughs> you know, like, I would ask myself what they'd want to do with it, right? Yes, so, yes, yes, yeah, yes, you have to tell them, yeah. very good. Yes, you yeah. have to explain, you know, this is the kind of paper that you might need, you know, to have your graduate students who are, who are you know, who are doing research in this area. I think that's a very good idea. But the key thing is this, many researchers, many academics, people like you and me, they don't feel comfortable setting, you know, uh, communicating their ideas directly to people. It was me 10 years ago, but me now, I will send my papers to everyone under the sun, but I will tell them, of course, the reason why I'm sending them. There's a recent article uh, in BBC very interesting. I think you should take a look at this. Why self-promotion doesn't have to be a taboo. Uh, well, self-promotion for the sake of promoting yourself is not a good thing. Yeah. But self-promotion in the sense of you want to engage the public, you want to communicate a piece of good research to people. I think that's not a bad thing, especially in today's uh, world. And the words that people are using now is public engagement instead of, you know, doing a self-promotion. Anyway, last stage in the uh, knowledge ecosystem. Remember the first one is knowledge production, knowledge creation, yeah? And number two is knowledge translation. 
And number three is, what is number three again? Knowledge spreading, basically informing the public, yeah? And number four is system enabler. This is probably the most important because this is how your research actually gets translated into real applications in, in my case, in the classroom. Yeah, let me share with you some ideas. Three different ideas that you can think about. There are many other ideas, I'm sure, but these are three that I've tried myself. The first one is consultancy. Second one is workshops. Number three is doing a joint research or joint publication. Let me just give you a very quick examples of what I've been doing in terms of number one, number two, and number three. Yeah, let me begin with the first one. Curriculum consultancy. Now, this is the kind of thing that you may want to do because you are working directly with people who are likely to make changes to their curriculum based on input from you as an external expert. So try to do this because, because this is one excellent ways of getting your ideas actually uh, translated into you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, new curriculum. I've done several consultancy and I keep on receiving invitations uh, to help colleagues from the region to look at their curriculum, to look at their you know, uh, syllabus, to uh, advise on new ways of doing things in the classroom. Uh, these are two examples that I've done. The first one is English language teaching syllabus curriculum that belongs to the Ministry of Education Singapore. And that is pretty much high impact because your ideas then uh, get implemented in some way in the new syllabus. And I'm happy to say that some of the ideas that I give during the uh, preparation of the, uh, of the uh, introduction of the new syllabus, my ideas, I can see that my ideas are being used there. Number two is a university in Vietnam who consulted me on their new uh, English language uh, program. I provided my input they accepted some of my ideas, and now my ideas in some way is being uh, implemented in uh, that new university in Vietnam. Oh, Anna, this university, by the way, uh, I hear it's a very brand new university. Uh, it's an English uh, medium instruction university, and they pay very well. That's what I heard. <laughs> but you're not into money, so don't worry about this. Hong Kong is also a very nice place to work. Uh, one point that I put there in my slide is this thing by invitation only? The answer is yes and no. Yes, if you're well known, like Professor Richard Day, you will receive a lot of invitations. If you are not well known yet, be proactive. That's what I do. That's what I've been doing the past few years. Talk to people, talk to head of department, talk to deans and tell them that, hey, your curriculum has not been reviewed for the past five years. Can I help? they're likely to say yes. If you add an additional piece of information, say something like it's free. It's a free service from me to you. I think they, they will welcome uh, your help, your assistance. Workshop is another way of doing this, yeah? And I've done this a lot. And here are some one or two examples. The first one is a two week long multi-city workshop in Indonesia. The image is wrong. That is supposed to be Indonesia. So together with my buddies at the Extensive Reading Foundation based in Japan, we travel to a number of cities in Indonesia, visiting a number of universities and giving free workshops basically. And at the end of the two week period, we had seen about 1000 teachers, you know, uh, being fully informed about what extensive reading is and why extensive reading is something that they need to include in their uh, English language teaching program. The other one here, so to me, this is an example of, of a high impact workshop. Another example of a high impact workshop is one that I did at Chulalongkorn University. This was last year. Very, very interesting. Again, I gave a free workshop to you know, teachers and to also important people working in the English language teaching unit of that university. The workshop was then followed by several power lunches. You know, power lunches means, you know, you, have, you do a lot of lobbying, you do a lot of, you know, a subsequent talking to important people, you know, who make decisions in that university. My effort paid off actually. The university decided to adopt extensive reading 
And starting this year, 5,000 first year students are now enrolled in their extensive learning program. And they are, they are using this uh, digital library called X Reading. 5,000 students are doing it now. That to me is impact. That to me is one excellent way of reaching out to important people, to stakeholders that you want to uh, engage. Join research, finally. That's another thing that I've been doing. Yeah. So the past few years, I've been, you know, I've been trying to uh, work with emerging scholars on topic areas, research areas that I am, I'm, that I have a lot of expertise in. The reason is for buy-in, basically. I want more people to, uh, to, to, to learn and to know more about the uh, kind of research that I'm doing. And also writing with top scholars for higher impact and higher possibility. Like working, writing with Richard Day, writing with Stephen Krashen and things uh, like that. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, let me summarize again my presentation this afternoon, this evening. Remember this, we all have a role to play in making research more meaningful and accessible to our stakeholders. We should not just be doing number one. If you just produce knowledge, produce research, you know, on a daily basis, yes, you'll get promoted. You'll get to, you know, be appointed full professors eventually. But I think you may be missing something because eventually you want your work to be communicated, to be translated, to be uh, implemented uh, in important ways in uh, the world out there. Some references for you. All these references, uh, the first two are freely available in my website. The third one is not free. Just publish this year, professionalizing your English language teaching. Uh, edited by Kristin Kum, and uh, the other one is somebody from Hawaii, uh, Anderson. Professor, what's the first name? I can't remember. Anderson, a reading specialist. Yeah, and this is my website. It's called Willie's ELT Corner, where learning never ends. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have yeah. about uh, research production, about research translation, and about research uh, dissemination.